So uh, uh, my name is indeed Tom Hendrickson. I'm one of the general partners at Open Ocean. And as we are, I mean, we are not an LP. We are a GP, a, a venture capital firm investing in, in, in startups. And we invest in data intensive software startup at, at the early stage. So I guess that's, that's why I'm sitting here uh, uh, helping moderate this discussion with some fantastic uh, panelists who indeed all are LPs, i.e. investors in venture capital funds. And they represent three slightly different types of limited partners, but I will let them uh, introduce them themselves. So, so great to have you all here. And why don't we start with Natalia? Who are you and what do you do? Thank you, Tom. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Natalia Ilmark. I'm with Scandia Mutual Life Insurance Company in Sweden. I've been with Scandia for 15 years, investing in venture capital funds in the US and Europe. And Scandia has actually been investing in VCs since the 80s. And today we have 1.5 billion dollars in venture capital funds that is in fair market value. We have 70% of the portfolio currently in, in the US and 25% is in European VC funds. We invest in both tech and life science, um, but we follow a strict uh, bottom-up strategy with no target allocations to geographies or sectors or, or, or stages. And we have a strict financial targets, uh, no, no strategic uh, targets. And um, yeah, in, in practice, we, we have to beat the, the public market and, and we look for funds that can generate at least a 20% net ROR for us. Fantastic. Thanks for that. And then uh, let's uh, take Sven next. Hello, my name is Sven Lignade. And as my name doesn't tell you, I'm Swiss, um, uh, Norwegian origin. Um, been in venture capital for 30 years uh, as a GP uh, for um, Genevest first and then Vision Capital, um, also uh, Endeavor Vision, the largest medtech uh, growth fund in, uh, in Europe. And um, uh, last year, uh, we rebranded the Genevest for reference capital to serve very large uh, families uh, with their uh, um, venture capital investment uh, strategy into uh, VC funds. So we are not a fund of fund. Uh, we do tailor-made uh, uh, programs for very large families. Uh, so we have no constraint of time, uh, pace of investment. Uh, we are trying to basically time um, uh, the market and also to um, uh, invest, you know, like in period like this, a little bit more actively. And, and then we also select um, uh, where we invest in the world, uh, Typically, it's 55% in the US, 20-25% uh, uh, Europe, Israel, and the rest in China. And we're also exploring India right now. Uh, in terms of um, uh, sectors, uh, we invest uh, in everything that is uh, VC um, related and makes sense. Uh, and then in terms of um, uh, uh, stage, we invest from uh, pre-seed funds to uh, growth stage uh, funds. And we are now launching a platform for our families for C stage investing because we believe it's a, it's quite interesting. Um, now, you know, I just want to to say that uh, we will invest in maybe twelve funds globally, uh, which uh, is uh, not that much. Um, we we invest uh, typically five to thirty million per fund, and uh, uh, yeah, and, and in terms of the uh, uh, history, we have also done a lot of direct investment, so. We, we like to, to do co-investment, but again, we have no pressure uh, to do co-investment. We always co-invest with a VC that we like at the same terms and same condition. Uh, the deal either comes from us or comes from uh, uh, some of the LPs. And one particularity, we have 25 experts who are all kind of, you know, former entrepreneurs, uh, VCs, uh, um, manager of large corporation who are helping us uh, to pick uh, uh, the uh, right uh, VCs and also uh, the right underlying companies. All right, thank you, Sven. And then last but not least, Bjorn, who considering the previous session, probably doesn't really need an intro, but why don't you do a short one anyways, uh, because we might have a few new listeners here. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, 
Bjorn Tremery, I'm responsible for tech investments at European Investment Fund. Uh, we're the largest uh, investor in entrepreneurship, innovation, venture capital in Europe, investing 1.6 billion per year on average in anywhere between 50 and 60 funds per year. Um, we've been doing that for over uh, 20 years. Have a good insight into the market. Are uh, happy backers of some of the people here on the panel as well. So uh, glad to be with you, Tom. Thank you, Bjorn. And once again, we are on a panel. Last time it was in Berlin, pre-COVID, and it was in -COVID. real face-to-face -face life, strangely enough. Indeed, so, we were allowed to shake hands still. Exactly, exactly. So we promised to discuss today how these LPs, and here I think it's quite interesting you when you when you hear hear from these three, you you hear of three quite different types of LPs. So maybe we'll hear hear some different uh, answers as well to to the same question, which I will pose to everyone. And we promised to discuss how these LPs uh, use data for uh, kind of identifying and analyzing uh, GPs, fund managers, and funds to invest in. And then uh, for the actual selection, do they use something more and, 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 and certain tools there? And then once they have invested for evaluating the performance of, of these managers. So we'll try to get into this. And let's start with something fairly broad, which is, you know, what kinds of data sets do you use in general and for these specific purposes that I uh, commented on here? And what, what do you really look for in using these data sets? So a pretty big, broad initial question. And we'll again start with, with Natalia, but we'll, we'll probably mix the order around a bit going forward. Okay, thank you, Tom. So, well, I, I'd like to start with, you know, highlighting the fact that we, we, um, we run a concentrated high conviction portfolio and we focus on uh, leading and experienced VC groups, which means that we don't invest in emerging funds and, and first time or second time funds. Um, we have done that in the past and we can actually do it, but the, our strategy is not based on that. And the first two facts that I would like to highlight that are kind of two pillars on our investment approach and our strategy is that persistence is high in venture and the likelihood uh, for top quartile fund to also be a top quartile fund uh, the next time is very high, it's close to 50%, depending on what data you look at and so on. But uh, that's kind of the, the pillar that our strategy um, is based on. And when we look across our portfolio, we can actually see that, that the best GPs tend to outperform across different vintages, not only in, in the good ones, which is obviously much easier, but they also you know, are holding up quite well. Um, and often top quartile performers in the poor vintages. And that's very important for us because we are not shooting for, for, for the moon here. And um, of course, GP selection is key. So what do we look for? I mean, we look for strong and experienced teams. And what do we mean by experienced teams? I mean, it can be investment experience, but it can also be operational experience. Often it involves some kind of startup experience it doesn't have to be a successful startup experience. You learn a lot from mistakes as well. So you have to be pragmatic about that. We see and look in our, when we look in our portfolio, we see that our GPs have some type of competitive edge. They might be the go-to firm within a specific sector or market segment, or maybe a geography. And um, that's important for us. And how, how do we validate this? I mean, it's, uh, it's done through a lot of reference calls, so all the data points. It's, uh, it's mostly uh, validated through, through qualitative um, data and, and a qualitative approach, actually. And um, what else? I mean, brand names tend to have better deal flow than less brand name firms. I'm not saying that firms that don't have a brand name don't generate um, good deal flow, but the brand name tends to have the best one and success tends to feed success, at least that what, what we have seen. And um, it, it's quite interesting because when, when, uh, when, was, you know, when, when I got the question to talk about data on this panel, I immediately thought about quantitative data, which is kind of what 
comes to your mind, but venture diligence is very much a qualitative process, I, I have to say. I mean, for us or for me, I spend hours and years and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, networking and, and, uh, and so on um, before we make an investment. And uh, of course, we look at track records and we slice and dice that and, and, uh, and, and we use external databases such as Crunch, Crunchbase maybe um, to kind of understand um, the portfolio company, um, you, you know, what type of portfolio companies that the GIP actually invest in. But it's not like a screening tool, it's more like a validation of a already um, conf, kind of, you know, set up investment thesis because it's not about numbers here. I mean, that's really, really important to, um, we, uh, to confirm and, 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 and to say here, it's it's uh, we invest in teams uh, first of all all right thanks i want to make one picture i want to just a very basic thing for our audience so a top quartile return what does that mean in numbers although i understand that it's more than just numbers yeah so um we have generated a 20 percent net rr over a 15 year period um across our venture portfolio and that is top quartile for us. Yep. That sounds, sounds about market too, indeed. So uh, then uh, Sven, why don't you go next? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, our mission at Reference Capital is slightly different than you know, Scandia and EIF in, in the way that you know, um, we, we have a, a, a certain amount that we decide to, to, to invest. So we are really looking for uh, a, a few gems. So um, uh, I, I would say that, you know, when you start about, uh, and I, I will repeat uh, what Natalia said, um, it, it's about uh, a qualitative first and, you know, our, it's in our name. Uh, Natalia, uh, uh, thank you, use the name reference and, and that's basically our name. And, and this is basically why it's our name because everything is about, about starting re with reference. Now, you know, uh, when you speak about data, and, and, and Tom, you know that, um, uh, you know, big data, in venture capital, when you look at the, the, the total population of funds, I think it's 24,000 funds in, in the world, 8,600 partnership, maybe. Um, uh, this is not big data, it's really a small amount of data. So, um, uh, and, and it, it's about the forest and tree, right? So um, the, the way that we are uh, uh, looking and, and using, using data is we are trying to uh, look at each of these forests and, and, and benchmarking uh, basically the data that we find in each of, of the sectors. And you know, when the data does not match, then we, we would uh, not invest in, in, that, uh, in that forest. For instance, you know, uh, if you look at, at clean tech uh, uh, funds, uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult to get like uh, a, a, a large uh, a population of funds who have basically <coughs> performed uh, uh, very well. So it, it, there should be also um, a timing, and, and this will change, by the way, this will change in the, in the coming years, absolutely sure. Uh, but, but there is a, 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 some areas where we don't yet have uh, the data that, that is uh, necessary. So um, I would say it's like, you know, when you drive a car is, is uh, you know, the instruments are nice, but if you look only at the instruments, you know, you, 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 you have an accident in venture capital, it happened very fast. So, so uh, uh, it's like looking in a, rare, a rear mirror. Uh, if you look only at the data that a, a fund or a team has produced, then, then you are probably hitting a wall. So, so there is a lot of, of, of uh, understanding for us, the underlying portfolio company. And where the data is interesting is um, at Reference Capital, we don't necessarily spend that much time on, you know, the, the DPI, TDPI also, you know, I mean, obviously we look at them, but we look at the data of the underlying portfolio companies. We look at, you know, um, what, what we need to have a sentiment and, and, and the view about uh, the partnership where they invest and we, if we are excited about the underlying company. And that is where, you know, uh, more data are available. So we, we would look through a partnership, how they look at the data. And, and uh, we've invested in funds that are very, very data oriented. There is like a, uh, less than 70 funds that uh, today are you know, focusing on, on, on data. And we've invested in Goodwater uh, and Signal Fire in the US. And, and, and those guys know how to use data. And I will stop here. All right, thanks, very interesting. Bjorn. 
Yeah, we um, we know the topic of data quite well as well, of course. Um, the issue was when we started doing this in the mid 90s, there wasn't much data available in Europe. And basically the only data that uh, was becoming available was the, the one about the funds that we were investing in ourselves. And then, um, so, so I'm not investing in the US, I'm not investing in China. Um, many people, institutional investors say that without data, I'm not investing. Um, good point, yet in, in, in China they're investing and there, there is even less historical data available than there is in, in Europe. So sometimes that's, that's a statement that needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. But then back to the data in Europe. So we were gradually discovering that actually we had the largest database on European venture out there. Yet Mike once said that you can you cannot benchmark against against yourself. So we needed to have a um, uh, an external source where we could uh, could compare compare ourselves with. So at the time uh, when I joined the IF at the beginning of the the, the new millennium, um, um, we used uh, the Thomson Reuters Venture One, but but that that's disappeared on Europe. Or I think another data provider ha has acquired the database now, and uh, I forgot the name there. Um, but gradually we built our own database and we were looking for other data providers then and you have uh, quite a number out there. Um, but the ones that work well for the US, the Burgess, the um, Cambridge Associates, they don't always have uh, the big data pool for, uh, for, for Europe. So we've looked at other data providers and we've actually for our own benchmarking purposes, we've looked for the ones that were most complementary with what we had ourselves. So the ones that were giving us uh, the highest additional visibility on what's out there in the market. And as you could see, for those that attended uh, my, my data session, uh, the, the candle bar chart that I put up, that's the combination of our data that we chip into Pevara. We chip in our data, uh, anonymous, uh, anonymized of course, into the Pevara database. Pevara is a subsidiary uh, of, um, of eFront, which is now, I think, uh, owned by, uh, by BlackRock, or is it Blackstone, one of the two. Um, and um, on, on that basis, we actually have the, uh, the largest view on the market. We are also using Brecken, and we're also subscribed to PitchBook, so which gives uh, additional data points. But I would very much concur with what um, um, uh, Natalia and Sven have, have said. The quantitative side is, is just it's just one element. You also need to check uh, what can be done, how can they repeat the successes. We would invest though in first time teams. Um, we do that successfully. Uh, surprisingly enough, if you look at the top performers in any given vintage, half of the top five is always a first or a second time team. Um, so if, you, if you're not doing that, you're also potentially losing uh, out. Now they come with more risk, not every first time team uh, uh, might build a successful franchise out of that. But if they do, you probably will, will see that the fund generations one, two, three have been the most successful that they've ever uh, built. And then fund generations three, four, uh, five, six, seven will probably not be as successful as the first three ones, yet potentially still generating some interesting uh, returns. So we would advocate that if you're willing to uh, take the risk, also look at the um, uh, at some more emerging uh, in managers. Now, as to the qualitative side, um, you, you need to do the, the, the quantitative, but also the qualitative. Even the quantitative, uh, one additional note there, benchmark data, even if it's compared or supposed to be apples with apples, um, I've, I've discovered as well over the last couple of years that net IRR, you can, depending on whether you use uh, capital call facilities or not, you can, you can boost the net IRRs and stuff like that. So you need to compare apples with apples. And sometimes uh, gross IRRs are becoming relevant as well. Um, and that brings us then also to the, the relevance of the team. I'd rather invest in um, relationships where the interaction is good, where the LPGP relationship is, um, is, is okay, uh, where you're getting added value in both directions. I'd be willing to compromise one or two percentage points um, in, in favor of having a normal, uh, respectful relationship rather than uh, a relationship where you're just a money provider and uh, they, they can't be bothered if you have a question left or right, uh, there's no there's no answer back. So those are elements that if, if we see that with a GP, even if they're the best GP out there, uh, I, I, I might go for the, the second best as well if, if that gives me uh, a less humane interaction uh, with, the, uh, with, with the counterpart uh, as well. Team stability, very important. If you're looking at track records, uh, the past is never a prediction for the, for the future, but looking at how team behaves with one another, with LPs, with, uh, with entrepreneurs as well, 
uh, even in the pandemic, uh, we've we've had uh, we've had some of the companies calling us that they were being almost blackmailed by by GPs uh, that wanted to, to to abuse the pandemic to 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 really have uh, uh, yeah, washout rounds or elements that I hadn't seen for many many years in in in, in, the, in the landscape. Um, so data, yes, but data is, according to me, not meaningful if you don't have the qualitative um, psychological side of uh, whom you're investing with. All right, all right, fair enough. So I'm a little bit sad here because I wanted, you know, being a very data-driven investor and trying to be that, I wanted us to get into the dirty details of the data sets, but it's like pulling teeth. No, just kidding. We will get back to that. But I want to, I want to ask you three and all or just you know one of you may may answer uh, a purely qualitative uh, question and that is if you have a new team didn't do venture investing before going towards a new market investing in i don't know what space let's say that if you have a combo like that would you ever actually invest this is just a yes or no question and if you answer yes describe to me how you would evaluate them would it be like like a coin toss or or what? Tom, can you bring your next question now? I uh, know. <laughs> <laughs> I I, uh, I don't know yet. What I'm willing to. Question is. <laughs> I, I'm I'm willing to, uh, to to take this one. I think this is more in the sphere of EIF. Uh, we have we have done this in the past, and we sometimes still do it. Uh, it's not the typical first time team that I was referring to. But if you want to develop new markets, new regions, sometimes are mandatory, and this sets us EIF apart from uh, from reference and from from Scandia. But sometimes are mandatory, and I apologize to Greece just because I use it as an example. But we've been asked to develop the venture capital market also in Greece. Over the last two or three years, we've put two or three hundred million into Greek venture capital funds. Um, so yes, the, the ones, and sometimes it's with tender processes, and then you score teams, and you will always find one or two teams that uh, the, the Greek, uh, the, the diaspora, people that want to come back from the valley, and, and but but those you can still benchmark, and you still can do some qualitative work. But people that have never done uh, an investment or uh, have never touched the sector, and you still need to help the, the market to develop. We've done that too. And then sometimes it was consultants uh, that were space consultants, or it could be a corporate finance uh, advisors, or it could be a tech transfer office. So you look for something ancillary. But it is, of course, I'm not saying that this should be the strategy of reference or of, of Scandia at all. But sometimes, uh, I hope I'm not guilty as charged then, but sometimes we are asked to do that as well. And we try to do it as best as we can. But that- you're putting the bar very high to to... To, to feel comfortable. And I think it's great you do. I mean, Greece is a good example. The team in at Marathon Ventures, I'm so happy they exist and they have lots of really interesting portfolio companies as a result of this, I'm sure. So Sven, yes. Natalia, anything you want to very briefly say yes or no on this one <laughs> before we get to an actual data question again? Natalia, go. Yeah, sure. And I mean, I I, I, I think that the, the simple, well, or easy answer from my point is that we don't, you know, we don't really have to take the risk, of course, um, and and we prefer to not take that extra risk with the team, but also with a new market. For example, in two thousand and nine, there was this big clean tech wave, and we were very cautious on that. We didn't jump on that, um, and of course, we had GPs that invested in, you know, clean tech deals, but those were in competition with other tech deals. So we didn't think that there was, um, first we, th- we thought it was too early and two, we didn't think that there was enough, enough of investment op- opportunities for, for the GPs that, that were trying to pursue this, this strategy. And I mean, maybe we, we were lucky, I, I, I don't know, but we weren't hit at, at, at least by that. Um, so we, I, maybe we are a bit, uh, a bit more cautious one. And, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there are, you know, uh, hundreds and I, of funds. And I mean, just listening to, to you, Bjorn, that there are, you know, a lot of emerging managers that, you know, have uh, magnificent returns, but we prefer to have it more consistent and, and be, be able to more cal- calculate the risks and, and, and so, so to speak. 
Thank you, Natalia. I mean, it's completely understandable, right? And it was a bit of a loaded comment and question for me because, you know, taking a risk on both a new team and a new market. That's a bit like we in venture don't really like to combine those those two risks, a completely new product and a completely new market, for instance. So so I completely understand that. Let's we we actually don't have much time left. We we started a little bit late and, and only have a few minutes left. So let's finish off with a bang and talk about the data sets of the future. So so you know, there's more data, there's more detailed data, there's more liquid data, and there's more real-time data. Also on startup businesses, these data sets are slowly coming together. So do you have any views? And why don't you, Sven, start, start this time on what kinds of data sets uh, you will have in the future that will be valuable to you and solve some of your data questions? Yeah, for, for me, uh, I mean, data is interesting when you can look at the data and you immediately see uh, something. So I think data visual, visualization is a place where I would say uh, we need the most uh, information. We've invested in, in a company called Quid and, and they started it a little bit into data visualization. Uh, and, and that is very helpful because uh, uh, um, you, know, you can have Excel uh, uh, full of, of data, but there is a lot of difficulty to extract what you are looking for. And, and so if I, if I had a dream today, is one is to have a you know, visualization tool that can look through the data in, in, in a very crisp way and very useful way. Second is, in terms of the data, I believe that in the future, you know, uh, we are we can break those silos of, of of people who have like all the data, and and uh, maybe uh, one day uh, one tool is coming like uh, the, the wiki of 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 the of the, the 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 venture, and where you know you create the prisoner's dilemma. You know, if a company or a fund does not pr uh, provide uh, uh, the data, then you know people can uh, uh, put the data and, and, and therefore push the people to, to provide, uh, provide the data. So I, I'm, I'm completely against those you know, silo. I think this is a, this is a past the young generation, uh, uh, who by the way will uh, uh, kick my generation uh, away. I'm, I'm already living that you know, so, so much faster. They are, they are much faster, they, are, they know how to use uh, uh, data much, much uh, uh, more than, than my generation. Great, thanks so much. And they're saying that we have to finish the panel, but Natalia, uh, Bjorn, anything still to add? Well, from my side, I just find it, uh, even at EIF, uh, I find it difficult to get uh, data that we get, of course we get yeah. it, but even that, with all the data that you have, private equity is a strange, uh, is a strange animal in the sense that you, you need to be able to compare apples with apples. And there's so many different things that can tweak the data. Uh, that if you're only relying only on data, um, I, I don't think that our job, uh, perhaps I'm naive here, huh? uh, that our job is, is something that soon be fully automized and that we can have a robot just taking, calling the shots because I think that the psychology in, into the aspects is still too, too important according to me. And I'd like to think you are correct and that the same applies for GPs like myself. <laughs>